Okay, three, two, one. Oh my goodness. Good morning, good afternoon. Whatever it is for you, I hope you're having a fantastic day. My name is Zach Schaumler. This is Strong Opinion Sports. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Today is Tuesday, December 31st. It is the last episode of the year. Man, I, I have a, a painful message to share at the beginning of the show, but that intro, it just fires me up. It's like it's hard to not get excited doing that. Um, it's the best way to start any pot. To me, it, like, it just gets me excited. I love it so much. Um, I want to be very open and honest about something. I have not been making as much content as I would like to recently. Um, I've been really struggling, and I, I don't want to take a break. You know, a lot of people are like, take two weeks off, and I don't want to. I just need to go at my own pace. Uh, for those of you who are un- unaware and unfamiliar, um, you know, first of all, I have an amazing life. I have an amazing job. I, I love what I'm doing so much. I, my life is awesome, and I have, I'm headed in a good direction that I feel great about. Um, I'm struggling in my personal life. I went through a breakup. It's been really hard the last I don't know, month, and it's been messing with my head. And so I, I just want to be very clear. I, I love my life. I love my job. I, um, I'll be myself again soon. But right now, um, I'm just going through the grieving process. I'm doing the best I can. Um, and you know, the creative process is normally one that's really slow. It's slower than I, it's, it takes a lot of patience and I hate it. Um, but it's, it's even harder to be creative and the creative process is even slower when you're emotionally drained. And I've just felt that way a lot recently. And so, um, I will be back to normal soon. I just wanted to be very clear. Um, I just need to go at my own pace right now. And so I love you guys. I really appreciate your support. Um, and I just want to be very, very clear. That's, that's what's going on. And I know it's, um, I'm making content as quickly as I can, but there's, there's, there are nights where, I just feel like crap and I just like have to be by myself and, and I, I can't do any work. I can't, it's, it's just been hard recently. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, again, this is the last episode of 2019 and that's insane to me. 2019 flew by. It's crazy how many things happened and how much went on. Uh, there were a lot of ups and downs. I learned a lot of lessons. I'm still learning lessons um, as, as life goes on. I just want to say thank you so very much for supporting Strong Opinion Sports. It means the world to me. You guys have changed my life forever. And it just means, it, it, I, I cannot express my gratitude enough. You guys support a Strong Opinion Sports. It's so meaningful. I have, I, I love what I do. I really, um, it's the great, I have the greatest job in the world. I love making content. It, it brings me so much joy. I love the stories, I love the people. I love interacting with people on Patreon. Everything I do uh, with Strong Opinion Sports is the best. And it, it really just, I can't tell you how grateful I am for your support. It just means the world to me, um, and I, I'm just, I just can't say it enough, enough times. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much. I just love it. Uh, I want to start with this today. There's a common thing I keep seeing in the world of sports, um, and I, I want to really be careful with my emotion here. It's because it's worse than I've ever seen before, and I want to be very caring and keep it, stay low-key for this topic um, I don't want to get angry. People keep complaining about referees and officiating. And look, I understand refs are not perfect, but I've accepted that. I've accepted that part of any sport is that there are missed calls and there are missed opportunities, especially in the world of football. And there's this attitude. You see it in sports. I've been seeing a lot just in life recently anyways, too. Um, it's people are blaming other people for their shortcomings. People are blaming rather than looking in the mirror and it's, I just, there are certain things in life you can't control. There are certain aspects in life and things that happen you just can't control. And you can do the best you can, but sometimes life is just unfair. And when I see people recently just enraged and freaking out and, you know, I, I, look, social media is awful, but even in person, you see guys rambling and yelling and screaming about referees and officiating and I'll be honest, it just makes me tired. It just makes me exhausted to see yelling and screaming about officiating. I, I just, I don't know. I, I wish refs were perfect. I wish officiating was perfect all the time. It's not, though. It's just reality that it's not. And I really believe that teams and fans need to talk more about the missed opportunities that their team missed rather than focusing on the one or two calls that a referee might have missed during a game. In football, for example, you can always do better on third down, or you can always do better in the red zone. You got to ask yourself, how many turnovers did your team have? I mean, this last weekend, especially, Ohio State got screwed. They got, I acknowledge, they got absolutely screwed. Two, play, two calls in that game. But that's two plays out of the entire game where Ohio State got screwed. 
They had a lot of opportunities. They were in the red zone four times in the first half, and they only got 16 points. They kicked three field goals and got a touchdown. They had missed opportunities. Or the Seattle Seahawks the other day, there was a, a, a missed pass interference call. And yeah, the league screwed up. I acknowledge that. But the play didn't, the game didn't come down to one play. They, they didn't score in the first, you know, they were losing in the first half. They had a big comeback. There were all kinds of opportunities the Seattle Seahawks missed. They had the ball at the one half yard line. And then they had a delay a game play penalty because they were disorganized. It's not like the Seahawks didn't have opportunities to win that game. Okay, I got to calm down. Um, oh man, the constant blaming of the referees. It, it, it just bothers me. It, it is, it's this attitude like, you know, the day that a team loses a football game or any, any sport, the day that a team loses a game where they are just perfect and the refs clearly screw them over, fine. But until that day happens where a team plays perfectly, I'm going to have a hard time being mad at the refs because there are always things you can do that are in your control that you can do better. You know, people lose a game and blame the refs for a missed call, even though in reality their team missed on key third downs. They had turnovers. They missed opportunities. They missed uh, all kinds of stuff. And I just think blaming the refs and blaming things that are out of your control it, so much is, is just, it's tired. I'm, I'm so sick of it. This whole year, 2019, has been people yelling because the, the NFL decided you can challenge pass interference calls. And man, ever since then, ever since that Saints game, it's been crazy. The Saints and the Rams played in the NFC Championship game. And ever since then, people have been just awful about referees and officiating. And it's like, look, sometimes they get things wrong. You got to accept that. And just acknowledge there are things you can control that you can do better. Um, and it's just this, this attitude. It's not just in sports. It's just in life. People constantly blaming others for their own shortcomings. It, it is just for me, I, I, maybe I'm alone in this. I might be the only person in the world. I probably, maybe I sound like totally inconsiderate. I don't know. But I just, I get so exhausted now when I see people yelling about the refs. I'm just tired of this narrative. It's just, I get it. The refs screwed up, but it's. Sometimes you just can't control it, and all you can control is, hey, on third down, you got to be better. You got to, hey, don't miss that pass. Don't drop that catch. Uh, make a better block. Do the things you can control better rather than complaining about the officiating. And I just think teams and fans recently just complain all the time rather than looking in the mirror and focusing on the things that they can control. All right. Um, the Cleveland Browns have cleaned house. The Browns fired their head coach, Freddie Kitchens. They also... Uh, I'm going to say it more nicely. They parted ways with their general manager, John Dorsey. And uh, John Dorsey was really interesting. He built a really talented roster in Cleveland, but he does not seem to value maturity or locker room cohesion at all. And I think that's the big shortcoming that John Dorsey faced in Cleveland with the roster he built. He made some big moves in Cleveland. You got to acknowledge he traded for Odell Beckham Jr., drafted Baker Mayfield. John Dorsey did a lot of stuff that on paper you go, hey, they got a lot of talent in that building, but... He appeared to completely lack the um, a, a, any desire to build a team with emotional maturity, and that's a problem. Whether it's you know Miles Garrett getting into a fight or Baker Mayfield's mouth or bringing in players with troubled pasts, John Dorsey as a general manager never appeared to value emotional maturity among his players, and I think that really cost him his job, and it cost him more success in Cleveland than he could have had. Now, uh, Freddie Kitchens, the head coach, I just feel sad for him. I feel so sad for. Freddie Kitchens. I learned about something recently called the Peter Principle. And the Peter Principle was developed by Lawrence J. Peter. Uh, it's from a book released in 1969. 69 is a great number. Uh, called the Peter Principle. That's the name of the book. <laughs> I slipped in a joke. Yeah, I hope you guys got it. Uh, of course you did. I'm immature. I'm 22. Leave me alone. I'm sorry. Uh, but the main idea is that at some point in a hierarchy, every employee rises to a level of incompetence which means that people get promoted until we meet a ceiling. And then when we meet, when we meet that ceiling, we reach a level called you know, it's incompetence. And eventually everybody ends up in over their heads if they keep getting promoted enough. And that's exactly what happened to Freddie Kitchens. He was just promoted above his pay grade, above his pay grade. He was promoted, you know, because he was good at his old job. And the reality is Freddie Kitchens never should have been given a head coaching job. He did not have the tools he needed to succeed as an NFL head coach. And it's really heartbreaking. I feel bad for Freddie Kitchens. I am sure that Freddie's job was to become a head coach. That was his dream. He wanted that forever. And he got his dream job and he failed. And he wasn't prepared for it. And he, he really should have never been in that position in the first place. And it's just sad. It really is. It's kind of heartbreaking. I feel bad for He like seems like a good man and a nice guy. Um, but the reality is that Freddie Kitchens 
did not do a good enough job making adjustments to, with his football team. He didn't build an offense that served the skill set of the players he had. You know, he misused their star receiver, Odell Beckham Jr. He stuck with what he knew and didn't build an offense that would help his players succeed. He didn't adjust. He didn't build an offense, particularly around Baker Mayfield, the quarterback's number one skill set, which is using RPLs, throwing short passes, getting the ball out quickly. Um, you know, he just did not set his team up to succeed, and it's really sad. And then Freddie Kitchens also showed bad judgment, both on and off the field. You know, he wore a shirt that riled up Pittsburgh. He, he wore a shirt blaming Pittsburgh for a fight that happened between the two teams. He stirred the pot just in, in an immature way. And um, it's sad because Freddie Kitchens, this was his first time ever being a head coach. And, you know, at any level, by the way, he'd never been a head coach before, which is baffling to me why they chose him. Um, and he just never should have been put in that position in the first place. It's just kind of sad when you think about uh, Freddie Kitchens. He just was not put in a position to be successful. And so moving forward, the Cleveland Browns, they need a grown-up. The Browns need to find somebody who, A, their, their franchise needs to find someone who values emotional maturity. But they also need to find someone who can help their young quarterback, Baker Mayfield, not only grow as a quarterback, but grow as a young man. You know, grow as a man. They need to find someone who's been a head coach before. They need to find a head coach who has experience coaching for a long time, in my opinion. And uh, in my opinion, there are two candidates. I'm sure there are more out there, but these are two that jumped to my mind as potential head coaching candidates for the Cleveland Browns job. Number one is uh, the longtime college head coach, Urban Meyer. And here's why Urban Meyer makes sense to me. Not only, number one, he's from Ohio. He coached a lot in, the, in, in Ohio just in general. He knows Ohio well. He's popular. He's lived there for a long time. And I have to acknowledge this first before we jump into things. Um, when Urban Meyer left Ohio State, his last head coaching job, there was some ugliness. And there's some stuff in his past that's not pretty. And I acknowledge that. I own that. However, uh, I read Tim Tebow's book. Tim Tebow's the former Florida quarterback. His head coach, when he was at Florida, was Urban Meyer. And I remember in this book, Tim Tebow talking about getting lunch consistently with Florida head coach Urban Meyer. And they, you know, Tim Tebow attributes a lot of his maturity and growth as a person to all those times having lunch with Urban Meyer. They go to his office and have lunch. And I really want that for Baker Mayfield. I really, really want to see Baker Mayfield in a situation where he's getting lunch with a guy like Urban Meyer three, four, maybe five times a week, picking his brain, learning about life, learning about more than just football, but learning about how to become a better man. And I think a situation, getting a guy like Urban Meyer would be so good for Baker Mayfield. You know, now Mike McCarthy is the former Green Bay Packers head coach. Uh, he won a Super Bowl. He is an offensive-minded head coach, and he's done it before. He has experience. So I think Mike McCarthy is another good option to be the Browns head coach. Now, there was some ugliness when... Mike McCarthy left the head coaching job in Green Bay. Uh, it sounded like Mike McCarthy was kind of coasting at the end. He, was, he knew he could get away with certain things if he was doing that. And, and I honestly find it hard to blame Mike McCarthy for the negative ending he had in Green Bay. Um, in Green Bay, with that franchise, he was dealing with a power struggle between Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, and himself, the head coach. And he knew that the Packers organization was going to choose Aaron Rodgers over him. He knew he was a sitting duck just waiting to get canned. And so I, I think that you can excuse some of the things, the, some of the stories you hear about the end of Mike McCarthy's time in Green Bay. I mean, if you knew you were going to get fired and you were sad about it and grieving, like I just, I think there, there are reasons for Mike McCarthy's behavior. He's a Super Bowl winning head coach. He clearly understands how to coach in the NFL. Um, and I really believe that his experience would be valuable in Cleveland, Ohio, as the Browns head coach. Now, whether or not the Browns hire Urban Meyer, Mike McCarthy, no matter who they hire, they must. The number one thing they have to hire is they have to hire an experienced, wise head coach. Hire someone who's been there before. Whoever that guy is, whoever they feel like they need. And I threw out two names. I'm sure there are other names out there that would be good. But the number one priority for the Cleveland Browns is they must find an experienced head coach who values emotional maturity. Okay, oh man, I got a doozy of a story. Uh, the Chicago Bears have fired their offensive coordinator, Mark Helfrich. They also fired a number of other assistant head coaches, uh, assistant coaches. And uh, they're keeping their head coach, Matt Nagy. I, I like that movie. I think Matt Nagy's not awful. Now, here's the real kicker, though. The Bears are also committing to Mitchell Trubisky as their starting quarterback for the 2020 season. <sighs> oh boy. 
Boy, it just it's it's tragic. I mean, the Bears management from the ownership to the general manager Ryan Pace, the Bears just cannot admit they were wrong about drafting Mitchell Trubisky. The Bears, if you remember, they moved up in the NFL draft to draft Mitchell Trubisky ahead of Patrick Mahomes, who's won an NFL MVP and ahead of Deshaun Watson. You can't blame them, I guess, for Mahomes because Mahomes was unknown as a prospect yet, but Deshaun Watson was very clearly a better quarterback than Mitchell Trubisky. They chose Trubisky over Deshaun Watson, and they just can't own that they screwed up. I mean, the fact they can't admit they were wrong is so, so awful to me. Um, You know, a huge important part of life is the ability to take in new information and change your mind. When you learn new information, you got to be willing to go, hey, let's reevaluate. Things might have changed. And, you know, that's something I'm really proud of with Strong Opinion Sports is that when I'm wrong, I'm willing to admit it. I'm willing to say, hey, I screwed up. I got this wrong. Uh, You need to be willing to have an open mind. And we're three years into Mitchell Trubisky as the Bears quarterback, and he's shown us what he is. He's not a good, he's a limited, he's a quarterback with a limited arm. He's got limited arm talent. He regularly makes bad decisions. He's inaccurate. He struggles to identify matchups. The harsh reality about Mitchell Trubisky is that he's just not good enough. And I, I know people that know him. They, they say he's a nice guy. And I, I'm awesome. I'm sure he's a nice guy. But being a nice guy doesn't make you a good quarterback. And he's not a good quarterback. And that's the problem. Um, the Bears are wasting years of their franchise because of their inability to move on and admit that they were wrong when they drafted him. That's sad. That's heartbreaking. I hope you learn from the Bears' mistake. If you see something in life and you're like, hey, I have new information, and it's been three years, and clearly this thing is not what I thought it was, or this thing is not working, don't be afraid to change your mind. Don't be afraid in life to say, hey, I was wrong. Because there's nothing wrong with admitting you're wrong. But you got to just do it. I, I just The fact that I think the Bears are going to waste two more years of Mitchell Trubisky before they finally admit, hey, we made the wrong choice, and their ego is getting in the way of them being a successful franchise. It's just painful to watch. And I, I just, man, I, it's very sad. I feel very, very sad for Chicago Bears fans. It's painful. It's awful. Now, with more news in the NFL, the New York Giants fired their head coach, Pat Shermer. And in my opinion, the five traits you need to be a successful NFL head coach are this. Number one, you need to be well-respected. You know, the captain of a pirate ship is not your buddy. The captain of a pirate ship needs all the criminals and thieves on the boat to respect and fear the captain a little bit. And if your head coach is not revered in the locker room, it's a big problem. The other thing you need is you need to be organized, number two. You also need to make good decisions quickly in the moment of a, like during a game, in a stressful moment, you need to make a good decision. I call that high-velocity decision-making. Now, number four, you got to make good decisions just in general. And number five, you need to be football smart. You need to have good X's and O's and understanding of play design. Now, Pat Shermer, I think, I, I can't think of an example that makes him, that says he makes bad decisions just generally. He seems like a guy who, he's, he's well put together, he presents okay. And he seems like he's been a successful offensive coordinator in the NFL. Clearly, Pat Shermer understands the X's and O's. But the three most important things you need to be an NFL head coach, Pat Shermer fails all three of them. He wasn't well-respected. He's not well-organized. He's very disorganized, especially he was in New York. And, you know, Pat Shermer was bad at making in-game decisions. He had to go. It's, I totally agree with the Giants firing Pat Shermer. Now, it's sad. Uh, first of all, good on the Giants, but it is sad that their young rookie quarterback, he'll be a sophomore next year, his second-year quarterback in the NFL, their young quarterback, Daniel Jones, their franchise quarterback, Daniel Jones is going to get a new head coach. And that's disappointing. He's going to have to learn a new system. Um, but I think I do think firing Pat Shermer is the right move. Now, again, here's what's sad. is I hope that the Giants can be discerning and hire a guy who sticks around for a while. I want to see Daniel Jones, the young quarterback, have consistency from his offense and run the same offensive system for a while. So I hope the Giants can give Daniel Jones stability because um, they need to find a, a, a new head coach who can help them develop their young quarterback. But I, I totally agree. I think the Giants did the right thing by firing their head coach, Pat Shermer. Okay, I want to play a clip for you guys. It's one of my favorite clips from the entire season. It's pretty cool. Uh, this is the Chargers quarterback, Phillip Rivers, after losing to the Kansas City Chiefs during Week 17. Um, he was asked what he's most proud of from his career. And, of course, he started the answer by saying normally he'd answer in regards to his team, but the reporters wanted an individual question, him to talk about his individual performance and his individual accomplishments. And so 
Um, you know, first Philip Rivers said that he's proud of starting 224 games in a row. It's pretty cool. But then he says this. Take a listen. This is one of my favorite quotes from the entire NFL season. I can say I gave it a, everything I had. I mean, every week, you know. So, you know, and, and maybe it means an interception on fourth and 18 when you're down 10. Because I don't care uh, that it's going to say two interceptions. You know, I really don't. It's just like I ain't quitting. So I think that, I think, I think that, that um, doing it with so many guys over, you know, 14 years and, and going to the locker room, win or lose, and I can say, that gummit, we're short, we fell, we fell short, but, or we won, you know, uh, but shoot, I, I couldn't try it any harder. So I think two different kind of elements there, but uh, I think that's the two things that come to my mind. Man, I, I love that quote. It's just so moving to hear. I totally, it just resonates with me. I get it. Like, I don't know how you listen to that quote and not respect it. I mean, I, there have been moments in my life where I've given my everything to something and I failed and it hurts and it's painful. And I just think it's so cool. I really recommend that you go listen to the entire quote. There's a lot of things he says. He talks about how he loves to prepare. Um, just throughout the entire interview, man, it's just so obvious and clear the passion that Philip Rivers has for the game of football. It's just beautiful and cool. I don't know how you, how you listen to that or not a fan of Philip Rivers and what he says. It's just like, man, you know, he shared that stats will not tell the whole story. I loved that. He also talked about enjoying the moment. And I just really connected with this interview. It was one of the most honest and well-spoken interviews I've ever seen. If you get the chance, go look up Philip Rivers post-game interview, week 17, Kansas City Chiefs. It's just like, it's 13 minutes and it's beautiful. It's just a guy sharing his heart and giving his guts and giving it all. And it was one of my favorite moments in the entire year was listening to Philip Rivers, a guy who, you know, 14 years in the NFL, he might retire. He might walk away and never play again. And so um, you never know. One of the things he talked about was he was very careful. He said, if another team wants me and if it's the right situation, the right situation, he'd do it. I, I personally hope that Philip Rivers goes somewhere and hope there's another team that wants him. I don't, I don't know what the film says about Philip Rivers. I'll watch the film and see if he's still capable of playing at a high level. But he certainly believes he can. And I find myself rooting for him. I hope that Philip Rivers finds a way to do something in the NFL again. It'd be really, really cool. And I, I just personally, uh, I, I listen to that and I go, man, what a dude. It's hard not to root for a guy who's so clearly, passionately in love with a game of football. Okay, here's a sad story. On Sunday, Panthers rookie quarterback Will Greer made his second NFL start. Uh, he played against the New Orleans Saints. And, oh, man, it was a disaster. It just, I, the sad reality is I will probably never, ever have a reason to talk about Will Greer ever again on this show. Um, like, I don't mean to kick a guy while he's down. I, it's, it's just sad to me. Um, but it was clear that Will Greer was in way over his head on Sunday in his second NFL start. Um, and it's sad because Will Greer grew up in North Carolina. He went to Davidson Day High School. Uh, he was drafted by his local team, the Carolina Panthers, out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And, uh, man, that would stink to go to your, your hometown, local, childhood team and blow chunks. I mean, I feel for the guy. It's brutal. Um, the stat line was awful for Will Greer. He was one for eight passing. He only had four yards. He had no touchdowns. He had one interception. He also had a fumble. Although, also, by the way, that interception went for a pick six. He gave up six points to the other team. Um, it was ugly, man. He was inaccurate throwing the football. He showed low arm strength. His deep ball was terrible. He threw a couple deep balls that were just nowhere close. Um, and I hate to say I was right, but I, I was really right about Will Greer. Uh, everything, I, 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 you know, a lot of people were very angry when coming out of college. I said, he doesn't have it. His arm strength, his deep ball's not good enough. People were very angry, and I recommend go watch the film. It's pretty clear. Um, he made bad decisions with the football. Will Greer lasted six drives in the second NFL start. The Panthers punted four times on those six drives. He also fumbled once and turned over the ball. He also had that pick six. And after six drives, he left the game with an injury losing 21-0. to zero. And I just feel bad for the guy. Will Greer should have never been playing. He was put into a situation way over his head, uh, and Will Greer does not have the necessary tools to be an NFL starting quarterback. Sadly, again on Sunday, we probably saw the last we will ever see of Will Greer playing significant time as an NFL quarterback. Unless he makes dramatic changes and improves his game a ton, we're probably never going to see Will Greer play a significant time in the NFL ever again. And if he does, I'll talk about it. It'll be awesome. I really hope that maybe a game like four years from now, he comes off the bench. He's like the backup for the Kansas City Chiefs and does what Matt Moore did and just dominates and plays great. That'd be so cool. Like, I really hope that it's not the end of Will Greer's career. He seems like a nice man. I love his beard. Um, but Will Greer, as a starting quarterback, 
doesn't have the tools that are required. He just is not a quarterback that is an NFL franchise quarterback. And that's sad. That's a harsh reality. But Will Greer um, doesn't have it, and he's not the guy. He's not the answer in, in Carolina with in Charlotte, North Carolina with the Panthers. He's not the answer there. And I'd be surprised if we ever there was any reason to ever talk about Will Greer ever again on the podcast. So that's sad. Um, it maybe I will. If there ever is a reason to, I will happily. I hope someday he comes off the bench, has seven touchdowns, and leads a team to victory. And we can share, we can remember this moment and talk about it. That'd be really, really fun. Um, but sadly, I don't think that's going to happen. I think Will Greer, um, he might last a couple more years in the league as a backup, but long term, he's not going to last. And he doesn't have the tools he needs to succeed in the NFL long term. All right. Um, one of the coolest stories from week 17 of the NFL season was the Miami Dolphins beating the New England Patriots in New England. The Dolphins won 24 to. 27. The Dolphins had 27 points. The Patriots had 24 points. Again, did I mention this game was in Foxborough, Massachusetts, in New England against the Patriots? And uh, what's amazing to me is the clear progress that the Miami Dolphins organization made this year. I mean, during week two of the NFL season, they played the Patriots in Miami, and they lost 43 to zero. The Patriots were embarrassed. Excuse me. The Dolphins were embarrassed by the Patriots early in the year. Just had the, just completely embarrassed. Just awful. And the Dolphins started the year 0-7. And uh, they just steadily got better as the year went on. You know, they started 0-4 with four ugly losses. And the next three losses, they, they lost the next three games, but they were more competitive and slowly got better. And by week nine, the Miami Dolphins got their first win against the New York Jets, 26-18. to And this is a franchise and a team that just made progress. I mean, the Dolphins finished 5-11. and It was not a good season by any, like, by winning standards. But it was a good year of progress for the Miami Dolphins. They clearly, man, I, there's no denying that the Dolphins are clearly well coached. And it's exciting. It's really cool. Uh, and, and on Sunday, Week 17, beating the Patriots was kind of the culmination of all the hard work the Dolphins have put in and the growth they've made as a team to beat the Patriots. And things, for, for things to come full circle, it's really, really cool to me. Um, and the Patriots were trying to win. It's Week 17, but the Patriots had their starters. They were playing Tom Brady. They tried to, even on the last play of the game, they were throwing the ball around, trying to lateral and score. The Patriots wanted to win. If the Patriots had won, they would have gotten a first round bye in the playoffs. The Dolphins, really, man, it was so cool the Dolphins spoiled the Patriots' playoff hopes and made them have to play in round one in the wild card round of the playoffs. Um, and the Dolphins beat the Patriots at their own game. They outcoached the Patriots. It was crazy and bizarre. They executed really well. They played great defense. They were disciplined on defense. And uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that the Dolphins ran four trick plays throughout that game. And when things even, a lot of times you'll see on a trick play, if things don't go perfectly, then they just completely fall apart. You'll see it like you pitch it back to a receiver. He runs around. Nobody's open. So he chucks it deep anyways and throws an interception. And it's ugly. And it was clear to me that the Dolphins have smart players. They had guys with the ball in their hands. Things went wrong. And there was a moment where they pitched it back to receiver. The receiver was going to throw the ball a double pass downfield. It wasn't there. So he tucked it and ran for as many yards as he could. I mean, multiple times we saw the Dolphins make really smart decisions in key moments with the football in a trick play scenario. And that's cool to me. It just shows there's a good attention to detail in Miami. Now, I know the Dolphins fired their offensive coordinator. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, I wonder if it's because of Ryan Fitzpatrick. I, don't, I honestly have no idea why the Dolphins fired their offensive coordinator. But something changed in Miami. They hired a former a Bills guy, but either way, it's clear to me that the Dolphins are a smart football team and their head coach is the right guy. And it was really odd, you know, before halftime, uh, it was a tie game and the Patriots had the ball with 58 seconds left and three timeouts. The Patriots had the ball before halftime and they could have had a chance to go down and score. And instead, the Patriots decided to just run up the clock and kind of arrogantly, um, they just missed an opportunity to be aggressive and try to score more points than the Dolphins. They said, we'll just go to halftime and reset. Clearly, that was a mistake. They should have tried to get more points because they lost. And uh, the Dolphins made them pay. Here's how the game ended. The Patriots scored with 3 minutes and 53 seconds left. The Patriots took a 24-20 to 20 lead. And then the Dolphins quarterback, Ryan Fitzpatrick, led his team all the way down the field. They scored with, I think, 29 seconds left. And the Dolphins won 27-24. to 24. It was really, really cool. And uh, it's really sad that you know Ryan Fitzpatrick, the Dolphins quarterback, you know Fitz Magic, this cool kind of legendary character in NFL lore. Now, um, it's sad that if he was 24 instead of 37 years old, we would be talking about Ryan Fitzpatrick as the Dolphins quarterback of the future. I mean, 
the way the Dolphins improved this year and the way they came together as a team, it's just awesome. Especially now, we have tangible evidence the Dolphins got better. Week 2, they got annihilated and embarrassed by the Patriots 43-0. to Week 17, things come full circle. They're a better team. They're more organized. They're well-coached. Week 17, they beat the Patriots in New England. I mean, to me, that's just so cool. And I think the most obvious thing the Dolphins, you know, the most obvious takeaway you can have about the Dolphins is that they did the right thing by hiring Brian Flores uh, as their head coach. I mean, I was skeptical when they hired him. I can't remember what I said, but I think I was pretty down on it. I didn't believe in him. I was an idiot and wrong. Uh, he came from New England. He was a defensive-minded coach over there in New England. And uh, he gets it, man. Brian Flores, just round of applause. He's doing a great job. And it was so cool to watch him beat his former team. He went, he would coach for the Patriots last year. He came to, to Miami this year. And uh, to beat his former team in New England, and his former players were hugging him. They were happy to see him. It's really interesting that how it's cool how gracious, and it speaks to how great a guy Brian Flores is, that even after beating the Patriots, the Patriots are really gracious and happy to see him and happy to talk to him. He seems like a good guy that people love. And uh, I'm so happy for the Miami Dolphins. They hired the right guy. And I feel so good about the direction of their franchise. I don't know what their quarterback situation is long term. I think Ryan Fitzpatrick is their guy for now. But uh, man, uh, Brian Flores is absolutely the right guy. He took a team, probably one of the least talented teams in the NFL, and got them to five wins and embarrassed some other teams. It's just really, really cool that the Dolphins were able to do what they did this year and make the progress they made and get better the way they did. Uh, I'm just so, so happy for the Miami Dolphins. All right, um, I want to talk about another Florida team. I want to talk about the Jaguars and Tom Coughlin. And uh, it's an old story, I admit it. Um, but I never talked about, when it, about it when it happened, and I had to do a lot of research to try to understand what, in fact, did happen between Tom Coughlin and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And so, number one, you got to know who Tom Coughlin is. Tom Coughlin used to be the New York Giants head coach. He won two Super Bowls as the Giants head coach. He's kind of a, he's kind of a hero. He's a well-respected man in the world of football. He's a very respected figure in the football world. And uh, after his time with the New York Giants, he took a job as with the Jacksonville Jaguars as their chief football executive. Basically, he was in charge of all football operations in Jacksonville with the Jaguars. And uh, earlier in December, mid-season, the Jaguars suddenly fired him. And I was like, what? What happened? Like, I get it. You know, the, the Jaguars weren't winning a lot, but it felt like it, something clearly went on with the Jaguars. And then I heard a lot of rumblings, and I learned a lot in the process of doing research, and a lot has come out about the Jaguars and Tom Coughlin's time with them uh, and, and uh, it's very interesting. Here's what happened. First of all, we learned that, I mean, Tom Coughlin, from his time in New York to now, he's always been known as a strict head coach. You hear Michael Strahan tell stories about dealing with Tom Coughlin and how they butted heads because he was such a strict head coach in New York with the Giants. But attention to detail has always been really, really incredibly important to Tom Coughlin. And sadly, this time, I think, you know, he took things clearly way too far. Here's what I learned. Um, three days before the Jaguars fired him, the NFL Players Association sent a letter to all NFL players informing them that tw over 25% of all grievances filed against NFL teams were filed against one team, the Jacksonville Jaguars. 25, over 25% of all the grievances filed to them were about the Jacksonville Jaguars. And uh, the NFLPA was warning players, be careful when you choose your next NFL team to be a part of. And the message was clear, stay away from the Jacksonville Jaguars. And the Jaguars realized, oh, crap, we have a nightmare on our hands. Uh, they were going to have a hard time attracting free agents unless they made a change immediately. And so uh, the Jags owner, Shad Khan, um, said that he'd already planned to part ways with Tom Coughlin. But this letter from the NFLPA seemed to accelerate the process, and uh, they, they immediately fired Tom Coughlin. And these are some of the details I have learned since hearing about the Jaguars. First of all, Tom Coughlin fired players like crazy. Uh, he once fined Dante Fowler over $700,000 for missing treatments during the 2018 offseason. And they were mad that he wasn't doing treatment with their facility at their, at their training facility. Uh, and an NFL arbiter actually ruled that uh, the Jaguars, you can't fire a player for missing offseason appointments. Now, basically, Tom Coughlin was too strict. He had this like death grip on the franchise and personally, I agree with finding players for missing mandatory meetings. I played college football. You got to punish guys if they're late. You got to punish guys for not showing up, for you know missing workouts or missing appointments, whatever it is. 
there has to be consequences for not being disciplined as a football team. Uh, however, number one, the expectations got to be clear. You got to know the consequences all the time. And Tom Coughlin took it way too far. Um, he once fined Dante Smoot for uh, missing a breakfast meeting. He fined him $25,000. That's an excessive amount. In most places, that would be a $1,000 or $2,000 fine. $25,000 is insane for missing a morning meeting. And that constant kind of oppression, I, I, don't know if, I can't think of a better word, that constant oppression does not breed a healthy workplace environment. And uh, you know, to make matters worse, the expectations were not clear. That's really the cardinal sin here is that players were not clear what was expected of them other than you better not be late, you better not miss anything, and you got to be, f first of all, the Jaguars' clocks were set five minutes early because everything was, you had to be earlier, you had to be five minutes earlier or else you were late to a meeting, which is just weird and whatever. Um, but once Leonard Fournette was fined $99,000 for sitting on the bench during a game and appearing uninterested, that's what the, the fine said from Tom Coughlin, and here's the kicker. Leonard Fournette wasn't playing in the game. He was injured. He was on the sideline. He wasn't playing. He was hurt. And he was sitting on the bench, appearing un uninterested. I don't know about you. Have you ever been at a football game not playing? It's brutal. It hurts your soul. You're like, I want to be out there with my teammates. He sat down on the bench. And to find him for that was wild. And then they find another guy, $10,000 for missing a mandatory yoga session. Tom Coughlin was a control freak. He had guys, he said guys needed to have both feet on the floor during meetings. He needed to wear the same color socks at practice. I kind of understand where Tom Coughlin's coming from. He wanted uniformity. He wanted control and he wanted things run a certain way. But the reality is he took it too far. He was too strict. And the biggest expectation with Tom Coughlin, the biggest problem with Tom Coughlin was that expectations were not clear. As a player, you never knew what you may or may not get in trouble for. That's a gigantic, gigantic problem for any business or anything. If your employees don't know what's expected of you, that's just a problem. It's a huge flaw. And it seemed like Tom Coughlin would excessively find guys for, for whatever amount he felt like was necessary rather than really having clear expectations and being gracious ever. And uh, that's why Tom Coughlin was fired. I think he had good intentions. I think Tom Coughlin was doing what he believed was right. But in the end, Tom Coughlin took things way too far with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Okay, um, the NFL East was terrible this year. The NFL East was a horrible, horrible division this year. They were terrible. At one point, all four teams in the division had losing records. And the fear among NFL circles was that a team with a losing record, because of how bad the NFC East was, that a team with a losing record was potentially going to win that division and make the playoffs. Now, in the end, the Eagles won the division with a 9-7 and seven record. But in the playoffs, Eagles are still going to host a playoff game. They're 9-7. and seven. They're going to host the 11-5 and five Seahawks. And one of the debates that have come out of this entire season um, is that it popped up, maybe winning your division should not guarantee that you make it into the playoffs. And some people around the NFL said that the NFL should just allow the six best teams, the six teams with the best record in each conference, the NFC and the AFC, the six best teams, the six teams with the best record should automatic, automatically get in whether or not, regardless of, winning your division. And uh, here's why that's a bad idea. You cannot make winning your division meaningless. Part of why I love the NFC East in particular, you got the Cowboys, the Eagles, the Redskins, the uh, Giants. There's all this hatred between the fan bases. It's so much fun and so cool. Like Giants fans hate Cowboys fans and Cowboys fans hate Eagles fans and all vice versa. They all hate each other. And when they play each other, it matters. When, when the Cowboys play the Eagles, it's a big deal that I want to watch. Divisional rivalries in the NFL are awesome. You have the Chargers and the Raiders. You have the Steelers and the Ravens, the Cowboys and the Eagles, the Packers and the Bears, the Packers and the Vikings. And there are so many more divisional rivalries I'm leaving out. The Bills and the Patriots have emerged as a new, really fun, invigorating rivalry in the NFL. And these rivalries are so much fun because they have consequences. The winner and the loser is important. There are consequences related to making the playoffs. That is why you can't take that away. You cannot take away the fact that winning your division gets you a spot in the playoffs. It would tarnish and ruin and diminish those intense divisional rivalries. I love the divisional winner gets in. I, 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 if the team was 6 and whatever, I, what's even possible? The math there, 6 and 10. If a 6 and 10 team won their division, 
good on them because they still won the division over the other three teams in that division. If the Cowboys were 6-10, and 10, but they still made it in the playoffs over the Cowboys, the Redskins, and the Giants, good on them. They always will have, no matter what happened that year, they'll have bragging rights over other fan bases in that conference, in that division. And so um, I really think you cannot make winning a division in the NFL meaningless. All right, um, the Seahawks lost to the 49ers, uh, and it was, uh, I, I don't know. I have no problem. The Seahawks earlier on, on Sunday Night Football, I guess, was it Sunday Night Football? Yeah, Sunday Night Football, the Eagles and the 49ers played each other for their, the NFC Conference, NFC West uh, Division Championship, and um, the Seahawks lost. And I, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. I think that, that a lot of people were blaming the refs and really, really angry. Well, okay, look ahead to the playoffs for the Seahawks. The Seahawks are going to play the Philadelphia Eagles. And here's what I want. If the Saints win and the Seahawks both win in the playoffs and wild card weekend in the NFC, then we're going to get a rematch of the 49ers and the Seahawks in Santa Clara, California between those two teams. And I really want to point out that the two of the best games, not the two best games, but definitely two of the best games I watched this year were between the 49ers and the Seahawks. You know, it came down one game. They both came down to the final play. One was in overtime. One was the final play in regulation. And uh, I really want the 49ers and the Seahawks to play each other again for a third time. I want that rematch to happen. And so uh, a lot of people are upset about the way things played out, especially Seahawks fans are all upset. Look, you got to beat a bad Eagles team on uh, Sunday, and then you get to go back to San Francisco and play the 49ers at their house against a team that you have twice. You beat them once. You played them down to the final play the second time. The Seahawks have the opportunity to beat the 49ers when they play them a third time. And as a football fan, that's the matchup I want. I want the Seahawks. I want the 49ers. I want them to play each other in the playoffs. And I got to say, if the Eagles find a way to beat the Seahawks, I'm going to be heartbroken. We don't get that rematch, a third and final game between those two teams. That's what I really, really desperately want. Okay. Uh, we have one more bit of nonsense before the game, before the, the show ends. I saw an article uh, where... I was talking about how Bill Belichick might leave the New England Patriots to coach the New York Giants. And it's nonsense to me. There is, I just think it's so silly. I don't know who, people are clearly writing articles just trying to get clickbait. But here's why Bill Belichick would never leave the New England Patriots. You don't build Amazon and then walk away. Like Jeff Bezos built Amazon, this literally I think the biggest company in the world. You don't build Amazon and then just walk away and try to do it over again. No, you enjoy your spoils of victory of having Amazon. To restart would be crazy. And so I think that it's absolute silliness that people think that Bill Belichick would leave the Patriots to go to the New York Giants. And furthermore, you got to understand that some people are saying, well, it's because the Giants have a quarterback of the future and the Patriots are going to lose Tom Brady. The Patriots win for far more reasons than just Tom Brady. Like, I get it. I think Tom Brady's incredible. But if you went to New York with the Giants, he not only would have to develop Daniel Jones as a quarterback. He'd have to change the entire culture in New England, an acceptability, a, a standard of practice, a, a, all kinds of stuff would have to change in New York to work with Bill Belichick and his system. And he's approaching his 70s. You just later in life, when you're about to retire, you don't go to another place and just restart everything, especially when you're the greatest of all time with the greatest franchise in history. You don't just go build Amazon again in your 70s because you have already done it once. That's just not going to happen. And so... Um, please stop spouting nonsense that Bill Belichick is considering leaving the Patriots to go coach the New York Giants. All right, guys, that's all I have. Thank you so very much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Remember, uh, if you're struggling, go get help. I've been really struggling with mental health. Uh, it's a big deal. Uh, four years ago, uh, February 8th, 2016, my younger brother committed suicide and took his life. And it was awful, miserable, the worst thing I've ever been through. And so I encourage you, uh, I learned two painful lessons from that time if you're struggling, go get help. The Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. The Suicide Hotline is 1-800-273-8255. If you're struggling, go get help. Don't be afraid to reach out for people and reach out for help. Uh, my brother suffered in silence. He never told anybody he was having a hard time. I walked into his bedroom one day and found him dead on the floor. And it was just heartbreaking and awful. So I encourage you, please, don't be like my brother. I want you around. I want you here. And if you're struggling, please go get help help. But the second part, the second lesson I learned is something I could have done better, which is that I could have done a better job making it clear to my brother how much I loved him, how much I cared about him, that I was there for him. And I didn't. I, I feel horribly sad about that. I could have done a better job 
telling my brother every time I saw him how much I loved him and how much he meant to me. And so not only one, tell the people in your life how much you love them, how much you care about them. But number two, don't be afraid to have conversations with more depth than just movies and video games and sports. Don't be afraid to ask your, your brother or your sister or your best friend, hey man, how you doing? What's going on? Do you want to talk? Don't be afraid to have uncomfortable conversations. Again, go get help if you're struggling. The suicide Hotline, 1-800-273-8255 and tell your friends and the people in your life just how much they mean to you. Guys, my name is Zach Schaumler. Thank you so much. Happy New Year. Hope you have a great day. Uh, we'll be back on Thursday to talk about the college football games. There are incredible bowl games. There was a bowl game tonight, uh, Texas and Utah. Tomorrow, there's a bunch of bowl games. I'm excited to watch those. My dad's going to watch the Rose Bowl with me. Should be a blast. And uh, and I just hope you have a great day. Ba-dum-bum. Bam. We are